Okay, we are here uh, to start the year off. This is our fifth time doing this. We got a, a great group here. I know a lot of you guys are going to be watching home, and we're going to put this on YouTube probably in about 10 days, and it'll just be on Rogers Healy YouTube. I think it's just youtube.com backslash Rogers Healy. But uh, we started this off in, when were you, October? October. In September with Kevin LaBelle, who founded Visit in Maine. Then Thomas Gleason came and spoke in October, who owns uh, Olson, Olson Steltzer Boots out of uh, West Texas. And then we had Austin Udaly, who is the founder of multiple things like Blake, and most notably, as of late, Common Shares, which is going to be on QVC next week. And then in December, we had Spencer Nix, the founder of CrossFit uh, Dallas Central, and uh, just a, an influencer. And this year, we're starting off with a longtime buddy of mine um, who has been successful just about everything he's, he's been a part of. His name is Blake Wiley, and Blake and I met probably a decade ago through uh, one of Dallas's finest connectors, Ray Johnston of the uh, at Ray Johnston band <laughs> on Instagram. But um, Blake is a lot of things, and I think that if I was going to summarize his success in business, he's the investor's investor, and he's the kind of guy that does things under the radar. He's extremely successful, and uh, he's a West Texas guy from Ballinger, Texas. Went to UT, um, avid Longhorn fan, uh, big traveler before he got married to his wife Eve, and before they had Scarlett and Hutton, but Blake moved to Dallas right after college to work for Noble, Noble Royalties and just took the, the world by storm with, with Wolf and some other guys and um, just by the favor of God had opportunity to invest in things like Favor, Waterloo, Sparkling Water, um, uh, help me out here, Deep Eddy Vodka, Outdoor Voices, and an app that I had to cut myself off, off on multiple times called Favor. And then most recently, Blake and I reconnected through uh, an opportunity he had with the hottest growing cottage cheese brand in the country <laughs> called uh, Good Culture. So uh, Blake's going to share his story with us tonight. You guys that are watching online, we ask that you please comment with questions and we'll get, we'll get those answered. But we've got some stuff we're going to go over, but I'm going to ask him to introduce himself and discuss what uh, I forgot. So thanks for coming, Blake. Hey, Roger, thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks for having me into your mansion. It's uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, but uh, now I've known this guy a long time and, and always admired uh, his ability to uh, to network and his ability to, to uh, build a brand. You know, uh, when you name your company after yourself, you you you're living it every single day. And, and I've I've always admired that about Rogers and and uh, how he puts himself out there with his brand. And um, yeah, happy to be a part of this. Happy to keep it uh, pretty informal and take questions as we go or make a conversation or take questions uh, through the Facebook stream. But as he mentioned, uh, went to UT, was a, a big Longhorn fan through the, the good times and the bad. Um, came to Dallas and uh, started started meeting people in Dallas. And, um, you know, kind of when you, when you look at investing, I had a, a gentleman tell me one time, he said, you know, in public stocks, you can make money three different ways. You can make money with information that other people don't have, which doesn't exist anymore because information flows so freely. You know, when our parents were investing, they had to get up and read the newspaper and figure out who was doing what and kind of spot trends that way. And information flows so freely. And I think 70 to 80 percent of the trades now in the public market are done through algorithms and automatically. So, you know, it's like that doesn't exist. The second way to make money is um, in public stocks is uh, to have illegal information. And he's like, and I don't want to do that. And uh, <laughs> Ray Johnston, if you guys can see <laughs> Yeah, he has, he has all, the, uh, all the illegal information. Uh, and the third way is to be lucky. He didn't consider himself lucky. And so um, he told me that right around the, uh, the time that we started having opportunities in uh, what we'd call uh, venture capital or, or uh, private equity or off-market uh, situations. And, um, you know, the first, uh, first time we... We did something that was probably the, the worst investment that we've ever made, um, and the second one, you know, could possibly be the best, which was the the Deep Eddy Vodka. We we're uh, blessed to be a, uh, just a small part of that story, and uh, really had a front row seat uh, for that brand that ended up being the uh, fastest growing alcohol brand of any category for five years in a row uh, before it was acquired, and um, and then kind of that opportunity led on to other opportunities, other people in and the network um, and just kind of kind of grew it organically so I guess you could say it maybe started off by accident and then uh, now it's a very intentional process that we go through and uh, we see 
see a lot of deals out there, and, and um, you know, we consider ourselves really picky and choosy about what we uh, support and get behind. Well, share a story about how you even got into this space in the first place with the Deep Body guy and the sweet tea and how that kind of yeah, it's, uh, yeah, as a um, friend of ours, uh, Clayton Christopher, a phenomenal entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur had started a company called Sweet Leaf Tea, which you guys know with the, the grandmother on the front of the bottle. And uh, he took 11 years uh, growing that company, started it with $10,000 in his grandmother's tea recipe, uh, sold it to Nestle after 11 years. About that same time, we started hanging out with a guy named Tito Beverage, who was the uh, founders of, founder of Tito's Vodka. And we were mixing Clayton Sweet Leaf with uh, Tito's Vodka called Tito's Sweetos. <laughs> uh, along with that, um, drink called Firefly come to market, and um, Clayton looked at it and said, "You know, this—they're making the same mistake. They're using high fructose corn syrup. It, you know, makes you feel terrible the next day. Uh, they have ingredients that you can't pronounce. I can—I can make a much better product than uh, than this this brand that's out there. Um, and so that's that's really how that's how he started it. And then, like I said, we we're blessed enough for him to." You know, let us be, you know, be involved in, in uh, that story. And when you say us, is this is this us here? Is, is this the company that does most of the? Uh, that's us. Yeah, Access Capital Partners, and um, we uh, we got uh, Wolf Hanson in the back that we do quite a, quite a few deals with. I have a partner down in Austin, uh, Jim McDermott, that we do deals with, and uh, then we have a couple other groups, really really in Austin, that um, that sometimes we partner on deals, sometimes we don't. Uh, Sometimes one group will bring something to the table, and these people will be involved, and other times other people will be involved. So, yeah. And so, how did you parlay the Deep Eddy Vodka into a niche in the food space, and also just in the BC space? <coughs> yeah. Well, it just uh, once we once we were involved there, and, and uh, it seems like you know everybody just started sending us. They knew we were um, kind of interested in that space, and uh, everybody started sending us. Different and brands, the Shark Tank guy was a part of it. Do you, you guys know on Shark Tank how they bring in like a um, what do they call it? The, like a guest shark. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the guy's name? Rohan. Uh, yeah, a guy named Rohan Osa. Uh, yeah. Who uh, he runs a company called uh, Kavi Venture Partners, and uh, and he's obviously great. And, you know, sees really high quality deals, uh, so we participate in uh, everything that they do as well. And his stuff is mostly in the food and beverage category. Yeah, it's primarily uh, better for you. You know, really with what. Um, they realized is that um, a couple things, you know, it's uh, consumer today, they want um, uh, not just the absence of bad stuff in their food, but the presence of good stuff in their food. And so it's primarily uh, brands you would see at, at Whole Foods or uh, Target or Central Market, but it's, um, they're really looking for better for you brands that, um, that can replace the old brands that, that kind of we grew up on, you know. The days of, of us going and buying you know, a bunch of pop tarts and Seven Up. You know, for our kids, well, some of us still do that, but uh, <laughs> but those, those days are probably. You know, people just they want to feel better, and, we, and consumers realize how that how that makes you feel when you yeah. when you eat that stuff, and so they want, um, you know, they want better products, and they want to know the ingredients uh, in the products and be able to pronounce those. You know, we're all kind of drinking Waterloo here. Um, Lacroix obviously had the terrible headlines this past year that one of their one of their ingredients that nobody can pronounce is actually used in cockroach poison. Nice. And, uh, oh, you're serious. Yeah, yeah, I was being serious about that? that. Oh yeah, it was all over the news. Yeah, so that that's the uh, yeah that's that's the general idea in kind of the better for you uh, food and beverage. Yeah, you know, so you, are you seeing a lot of emerging trends in the food and beverage business that are worth discussing? And yeah, yeah, you see. Uh, um, you know, we really look kind of by category. What are the high growth categories? Uh, these um, plant-based uh, foods, a lot of huge trend towards, um, you know, less milk uh, in your foods and, and uh, more uh, more plant-based foods that uh, is supposed to grow significantly over the next several years. Um, you know, just five years ago, if somebody said they were uh, vegan or sometimes vegan or vegetarian, it was kind of a joke. But now, as we get older, everybody's realizing you do kind of feel feel better uh, when you eat plant-based snacks. Um, you know, we're uh, really interested in uh, CBD infused uh, food and drinks. We think that'll be a. Um, what does that mean again? That's like marijuana, right? 
Uh, it's not marijuana. <coughs> it's it's not marijuana. It's uh it's um it's it's the non psychoactive uh, portion of the hemp plant. So um, it's relaxing. It's calming. Um, there's uh, you guys can look it up. There's it's pot kind of. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not pot. It's uh, completely legal and um, so of course it's known. What's that? It's sold in Texas. It's sold in Texas. Yeah. Sold right by your office. There's a uh, CBD uh, store. Yeah, under right. our office. Yeah. Under, our underneath his office. office. Yeah. Really yeah. 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 You just have to buy it in the alley. Now you can buy it in the store. Yeah, it's right. really cool. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, you know, there's uh, a brand uh, called Recess, uh, R-E-C-E-S-S, that uh, has been really intriguing to me. Um, and there's, there's a couple of them out there, but, uh, uh, you know, CBD infused. And then... Um, Kind of like I said earlier, uh, the kind of absence of bad, presence of good. So uh, probiotics, uh, kombuchas, um, matchas, uh, things like that. Cool. So just as far as general business is concerned, like get, maybe give us three or five things that you look for as a company, as a partnership, as an individual um, that in your mind makes it a, a good deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, the really the first thing is obviously the financials and the structure. Um, you know, there's... Uh, there's a lot of what we call pre-revenue deals out there. That are, those have just seem to be really, really tough. And that's- What does that mean? That means it's somebody that has a great idea, but they they don't have a product yet. They don't have distribution. It's just, you know, it's your friend that wants to start something that could be really, really cool. And those are just really tough uh, for us to wrap our heads around because- It's called pre-revenue. Pre-revenue, yeah, they haven't made haven't made a dollar yet. So, um, you know, that's in some cases that those could be great, um, but those are, those are just tough for us. So, uh, the point of that being that first off we look at financials and then we look at structure you know what's the structure of the deal the structure of the company and um, I think those are those are two kind of pretty obvious ones um, one that, that uh, Clayton actually taught me was uh, invest in learners not knowers and uh, you know um, and you can really kind of tell that person apart during the pitch uh, does that person kind of downgrade your question or kind of act like your question isn't important and they always have the answer or they, do they have a little more of an open mind? So, you know, learner versus knowers is a big one. You know, we used to, uh, you know, work with a, with a knower and it, it was, you know, it's kind of, it's sad to see, but, uh, but so you want that kind of that open mind. Um, um, I kind of call it the home test or the me test. Is, is this a product that, um, that I would buy at the store? Is this something that my family would use uh, every week? Is it something, you know, with outdoor voices, is it something my, my wife would wear when she works out, or that I would wear when I work out? Um, and then, how often do you actually work out? Not o- not often <laughs> enough. We got a lot of the CrossFit guys here. Not often enough. But let's say I were to work out, would I wear it? That, that's the okay. question. Um, no, so I, I you know I think the first is learner versus knower. Uh, number two is is kind of the home test or the me test. Is it, is it a product that if we don't already buy it each week, is it something we could see? replacing something that we do buy uh, each week. And then the third is kind of a marketing term called, uh, will it play in Peoria? Which is just kind of, um, it means, will it ever go mainstream? And that's kind of a, an old term, I think it's pretty, pretty neat, but uh, the gist of it was um, when a new show would come to town, it was one thing if the show could make it big in Chicago and LA and New York, but will it play in Peoria? Will it reach the masses? Is it something that, that um, you know, you could see, you know, maybe relative, you know, people that don't live in Dallas, is it something that they would uh, eventually, you know, would they be drawn to? You feel like you know pretty quick once you guys put some, some capital behind it, you know if it's going to play or not? Uh, usually before we do. I mean, um, you know, uh, a lot of other things that, that uh, kind of that go into it, but those are kind of the, the top couple of things. But, uh, you know, we like to see a company that has, that has some distribution that's been able to, to prove itself up in, in certain markets and is ready to ready to scale and ready to, to take it to other markets. And what do you think your next big uh, play, who's gonna be playing in Peoria out of all the <laughs> um, access capital partner investing investments? Uh, uh, some of them already are, but uh, but uh, hopefully all of them. Oh, nice. Hopefully all of them. There's, uh, well, you just know. just enrolled to be for mayor. He just, <laughs> really he's our newest nominee. Yeah. Seriously, uh, though, which one? Probably good culture cottage probably, cheese. Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah, good, get out there and buy good culture yeah. cottage cheese. Well, I know you're a big Mizzen and Maine fan. I mean, that's a great, great yeah. example. That that plays in Peoria, you know? I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's, 
mainstream and you can see why people would would be drawn to the product. Yeah, cool. So what's one piece of advice you'd give to somebody who's maybe starting the business or they're looking for investors? Maybe let's do starting the business first and then somebody who is trying to raise capital second and then somebody who's wanting to go and potentially sell third. Okay, what was the first one? <laughs> so they want to start a business, like pre-revenue. Uh, want to start a business? Uh, <coughs> you know, make sure it's a, you're addressing a, a pain point, you know. Um, uh, one of our founders, uh, Ty at, at Outdoor Voices, always talks about the compression of time is very valuable. So if you have a, a product or something that can compress time for people, that's that's extremely valuable. But make sure you have a you know a large uh, addressable market, and it's a uh, there's there's some pain point that you're solving, um, and that you try to have kind of a a pretty uh, defensible moat. You know, um, you want something where you can get a patent or you can get. Uh, a unique way to do something that somebody can't just knock off and replicate because what we see all the time is, is every success has a shadow and every time um, you know every, every time somebody takes out the gate with something super successful there's there's four or five right behind them you know favors actually favors a great example of that um, when we first got involved there had never heard of anything like it, it you know you can get me casino brought to your door mm -hmm. that doesn't exist that's compression of time and that's a huge pain point and you know for uh, kind of the home test yeah I can see how my wife at home with two kids doesn't want to get out and have to go load up two kids to go to the grocery store to get something she needs just favor it and so favorite started in, in DFW it was uh, started in Austin okay as a lot of these great brands are we can talk about that later but kind of the difference between uh, uh, Dallas and Austin and, and um, kind of what that what that looks like in the kind of the startup but um, but, uh, you know, so we saw the, the value proposition of favor and, um, and then within, I would say within six months, there were about six really, really well-financed uh, competitors that were doing basically the exact same thing. You had Uber Eats, you had Postmates, you had DoorDash, you know, I think favor kind of separated themselves with the the blue tuxedo t-shirts and he tried to do an offshoot <laughs> <laughs> yeah you've ever ordered it yeah raver where you want to hear your favorite song and ray comes up to you yeah he shows up on your doorstep and serenades you but yeah. uh it didn't it didn't really take off that's why he's here yeah, that, that, like that caused yeah. a pain point yeah that was a pain point yeah you actually added time you, you took time away from us with raver so I all the rookies that attended the first time yeah man you're flesh <laughs> but uh no, okay. So, that, so the first, starting the business, secondly, once you have your, like, to get to, like, scaling up. Yeah. Right? So you have people come on Shark Tank and they're like, we have all these sales, but we need more infrastructure. We need more warehouse space. We need yeah. more guitar picks. You got to, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you got to start off with friends and family that first time you raise money. And to me, that's, that's some of the most important capital you take because if some, you know, big <clears throat> company writes you a, a $10 million check into your company, that's great. But, you know, it's a lot easier if it doesn't work out to say, sorry guys. Um, but when you get your friends and family involved in it, it's, uh, it's emotional for you. And it's, it's, uh, you're, as you know, starting a company, I mean, you're living it, eat, eating it, breathing it every single day. And, um, and you're just thinking about them and, and, uh, and the faith they put in you. And, uh, so that's really kind of the first, the first round you have to get. We were looking at some old investor decks, uh, today, um, you know, not that it came to us, but uh, that we we're kind of researching, and uh, we saw the original deck for uh, Airbnb, mm. and probably seven years ago, you could have you could have bought ten uh, percent of Airbnb for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, thirty seven billion dollar company today. Mm -hmm. Your one hundred and fifty would have been worth three point seven billion today, and mm. along with that, they put. Uh, they put 10 different examples of, uh, that they had saved. You had the opportunity? No, we did not have, uh, to be clear, we did not have that opportunity. Okay. We were researching this today, looking at um, LinkedIn's first investor deck, go, kind of going back and what's the average size seed round that people usually raise, what's the average size Series A, how thick is the, the investor deck usually. But um, anyway, the point being, they had to go raise money, but I thought it was neat, they had these, these uh, uh, the ten, 10 different people that told them no, you know, and uh, and it was pretty funny to go back and read those and see what a life change, you know, one of them's like, oh, so the guy kept pushing him for coffee. I can't meet you, I can't meet you. That is just didn't for us, you know, it's stuff yeah. like that. So I would say uh, persistence, 
you know, and um, it's kind of that, uh, you know, um, no doesn't mean no, it just means not yet, and so when you get turned down by that, except for that, dating, yeah, right. except for dating then no definitely means no, but, uh, but I, I would say just that persistence in the, in the fundraising, and, and um, cause you're going to get turned down a lot, you know, and you're going to, you got to have, uh, you know, and each no, you're closer to the, the yes, you know, and so. How is that how, just the persistence? So how has a company go and find valuation, whether it's a, a pre-revenue, like with, with real estate, obviously if you're gonna sell your property or lease your property, we can go and find a comparable property that's sold or leased, and that kind of leads us to the answer. How does a company go and find out what their essentially concept is worth, or two years in, what they're worth, or they're at a phase where they're 15 years in, and they're gonna go sell to a, a big conglomerate? What's that process look like? Yeah. You're, you're worth whatever your main investor t agrees that you're worth and they're willing to give you money based on that valuation. So it's, uh, you know, valuation is totally uh, negotiable. It's, um, you know, mainly you would look at, because uh, most of these companies lose money for uh, four or five years before they are actually profitable. Uh, they have several rounds of funding to get them there. And so, uh, you know, you can go off of, of top line revenue. Uh, you can go off um, uh, other transactions and other um, mergers and acquisitions that have happened in that category. Um, you know, we got some uh, some tech guys. That, you know, there's technology is typically valued a little bit differently than uh, than maybe an app or maybe a food and beverage company. And so it's really just. But y'all have like what, some what, sort of what we've typically seen is, is top line revenue, and you take a multiple off of that. And um, you know, so if somebody's uh, selling a uh, million dollars a year, you could say they're going to be worth somewhere between three and six million bucks. But do y'all have some sort of search engine you can go and see what like a comparable company sold for? Is that uh, not a search engine? But we have that. I mean, we have that data. You have a search engine. Yeah. Yeah. Google. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We definitely have the, the data. Of, Sounds great. Uh, uh, yeah. Of what similar companies would would be worth? Cool. So talk about social media and how that's changed the just the landscape of startup and business culture and maybe perception being honestly reality how, how does that come into play yeah it's uh it's been dramatic you know i mean up until uh 15 years ago you know people watched commercials 15 <laughs> years ago you don't watch commercials anymore um you know you had to be a, a big massive brand and go uh you know go spend a million bucks making a commercial and hope people see it and hope that somehow uh drives people to your product. Um, now it's, you can create a, a following on Instagram. Um, you know, it's gotten to where we could almost, almost uh, off of Instagram followers, we could predict what the valuation of that company should be based off of all the other companies that are out there. Wait, say that again? Uh, al almost, uh, yeah. if, so on Instagram, if I see a brand or we see a brand that has uh, 8,000 followers and we see a brand that has 80,000 followers, we can almost tell you the valuation difference between this brand versus that brand Seriously. without seeing revenue numbers or financials. You don't want to go off of that, but it's definitely a, a strong indicator. Mm -hmm. And so these brands can, they can build these followings mm -hmm. uh, really, really quickly, you know, and in a really uh, authentic way. I remember when I heard like, um, so which Kardashians is, is Kylie the one that's about to be a billionaire? Is that right? Yeah. Like the new book, right? The yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, no, she's literally that. No, yeah, I'm just she is. Really educated she is. Yeah. Kylie. Yeah. Yeah, they're Kylie, younger, right? Kylie, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I, I tell you, because you know, they, they read a post today about how she gets paid mm -hmm. upwards of $750,000 for a single post, but it's almost justifiable. And if you yeah. go get a brand and then get. Whatever, I, you're not going to get that many, that many eyeballs on a brand. I mean, you know, and, it, yeah. and, and what you'll, I think what you'll notice with celebrities now is it's not, uh, you know, Tom Brady saying, hey, you need to eat Wheaties. But it's like uh, it's much more authentic, and it's much more. You can see that they're consuming the brand. It's kind of Justin Timberlake with the buy deal, you know, and, and yeah. uh, that was. Uh, you didn't feel like he was just selling out, saying go drink this. You really felt like if you walked into his house and went to his fridge, he would have it stocked full. Was you the the smart water story? The uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share that with him. This is like kind of this is before social media, but smart water. Yeah. Which is like the long, um, yeah. the long tube water. Tell them, was it Smart Water? Yeah, no, it was. Smart it was uh, yeah. yeah, Smart Water that uh, basically went to Jennifer Aniston, and uh, they said we don't have any money to pay you, but we'll give you uh, ten percent of equity in this company, and you're just going to carry around this empty water bottle 
and when paparazzi starts taking pictures of you, just shield yourself from the paparazzi, <laughs> you know, using this this bottle, and then people will will see it and will buy it. And to this day, she's still the spokeswoman <laughs> of Smart Water. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, you can just yeah, yeah, hold water, that, water, water, that water, 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 yeah, You might spill it a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe so, get pictures of you walking down the street. With yeah, no, we'll we'll do this all day. Yeah. Um, okay, so. This is a question that Blake ha actually helped me come up with, and I really love it. Give us your rose, thorn, and bud so far for 2019, and to give you guys um, an easy way to interpret that, your best thing, your worst thing, and what you're most excited about. Yeah, we try We try to do that as a family. At the end of the day, we always have uh, dinner together, and um, you know, it's a good way to kind of ask about your day. What's, uh, like you said, the ro your rose, your bud, and we were trying to do rose, thorn, and then bud so that you end on uh, something they're looking forward to. But uh, I know I helped you with that one, but then I didn't know what I think about the how, how <laughs> to answer that. So, uh, what, what's the first thing y'all think of when you hear that? I think of Brett Michaels. I would, yeah, I would <laughs> say, poison. yeah. And every rose from having a thorn, and uh, the, the thorn wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the bud. So it's just kind of like a full circle question. That's really. right. Yeah. We need to go listen to some records in your record room in there, man. Yeah, it'll be um, after hours. Yeah. And then <laughs> sales, but we have one woman here, um, and it's yeah. getting late. So what? Uh, the the rose yeah, amongst yeah, the thorns, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so what's, what's your rose uh, so far? I, well, I, outside of business, I would say uh, the mighty Longhorns beating uh, beating Georgia in the uh, so in the I'm Sugar Bowl. That was the night of January first. So that was definitely uh, the high point, you know, and outside of family and kids and wife and everything. How about maybe in business? Uh, in business, uh, <laughs> just, I mean, we already we completed the one, uh, you know, the Good Culture fundraise, which was exciting for us to to do something. Uh, this early in the year. Um, How about your thorn for 2018? Because this year's already kind of fresh. And I, you know, I, I th the thorn to me is just kind of uh, is kind of broader society type stuff. You know, not to get too deep, but just kind of how ev you know angry everybody s seems with each other, and, and uh, I don't know. It just seems like we're you know maybe take a key from the top and everybody just wakes up a little angrier than we should, you know, and I think we're starting to see that tide turn and <clears throat> people are starting to realize that uh, life's too short and we're all here to have fun and, and uh, you know, love is better than hate type stuff. So uh, I think to me it's just kind of the broader feel of the country and, and people just seeming like they're always angry at each other. So let me parlay the, the um, love and being kind in, in, in regards to your faith. How does your faith play into your business, your business, your approach, your investment, and just your everyday uh, life. Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, always, Thanks. always been a believer, <laughs> and uh, um, I would just say uh, when my faith wasn't as strong, it seemed like I was uh, more stressed and more uh, concerned with the nuances of every day and and the, 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 the just the natural stresses of life. And then um, uh, whenever I'm kind of more in the book and um, you know, more bigger picture, then it, it just seems like that stuff kind of kind of fades to the back and, and life gets a little easier and you realize uh, what's super important and you realize what, what to kind of, kind of let go perspective. of. Perspective. Yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah. and CBD. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah. And CBD. So, like, what about heroes? Like, who, who do you emulate? Who are your heroes in the business world and in, in the personal world? Just, like... Charles Barkley or Michael Jordan, like who is it that Rogers Healy? Rogers Healy. Yeah. yeah. I'm sitting next to him. I'm sitting next to him. I'm sitting next to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I would say uh, all sorts of heroes. I mean, everybody from you know, what you watch your kid, you know, your son or your daughter do something and the way they do it's great. You know, you watch your friends do something and for them to be wildly successful at it is uh, is great. Um, you know, but I kind of uh, I, I'd say I love I love biographies I love autobiographies I've, I've never been one to kind of uh, you know read a book just to, you know for fantasy or some uh, wild thing about dragons or something like that I've always been more um, interested in like reading about Richard Branson and how he built this in spite of all the odds or um, you know reading just about different people and uh, when you start to read about different people, I think it's always so interesting because you read, uh, you know, like Forbes will come out with the top whatever. And so you read about some of those people and, and uh, you're like, man, you know, these guys that came before us, it's like, oh, he did this. And then uh, he went to war for six years and then he came back and finished college and then he did that. And you're kind of going, 
man, what am I doing? <laughs> and he died at like 32. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. He, yeah, and he did all this mm-hmm. stuff. And so, uh, you know, I, I would just say uh, try, and when I see somebody that's successful, try to take maybe their best quality of what they do the best and um, try to emulate that or try to incorporate that into, into what we do in, in our life. And then, um, you know, because I don't think there's anybody out there that you want to, you know, everybody's got vices and everybody's got, um, you know, um, so I don't think there's anybody out there you want to say, I want to be just like that guy, but maybe, you I want to sing like Ray, but not <laughs> <laughs> swipe like Hey, you're the punching bag, sir, yeah. Ray. Yeah. Golly. What? Hey, sit in the front. That's what happens. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, how about like, uh, yeah. if I, for, for people that like maybe don't read books and um, don't have the, you know, the diversity you do as far as the, the research and the, um, just the information, who are, who are five people that you like to follow, whether it's a Richard Branson or somebody that, you know, gives you vigor and, and, and excitement that you find you find inspiration from. Who would they be? Oh man, five? Ten. <laughs> 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 I mean, just yeah. uh, you know, like I'd, even like if it's social media. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, you know uh, Clayton Christopher, the guy that started uh, Deep Eddie Block, has been uh, just watching what he creates and puts his hands on, and it's actually his birthday today. But Happy uh, birthday, Clayton. Just uh, you know, it seems like what the things he touches just are fantastic and incredible and, and so he's always been um, you know a mentor I got uh, a couple buddies we got Wolf here and, and uh, buddies uh, Jim uh, McDermott Joe Warnock down in Austin that uh, you know I think stuff they do is fantastic and how they they uh, choose to live their life is fantastic um, uh, business wise uh, you know uh, big follower of, of Dave Asprey the Bulletproof Coffee guy he uh, Kind of started the whole keto, good fats uh, movement, and um, you know, the guy that drastically changed his life. I mean, he was, uh, you know, over 300 pounds and miserable and uh, financially successful, but was just miserable and um, started drinking fats and uh, lost 100 pounds, and now he's like this the forefront of this thinking as far as um, I know a lot of the um, uh, kind of the. You guys help me out. What are the uh, back tattoo? No, the, the <laughs> your your business that you do. Yeah, what's that? A Canadian chain for like um, PT, like physical therapy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he's at the forefront of a lot of these uh, different techniques and things to make your body uh, feel good. You know, all and, from that guy's thinking. Yeah. Uh, well, he is. Le- he's got. He's the thought leader for that whole the uh-huh. whole kind of category. You know, what we see is uh, millennials are actually the first first group that. Um, actually spends more money on, on what they put in and on their body, uh, whether it's like topical lotions and, and creams and things like that, or it's food, uh, than they actually do on, on clothing or travel or things like that. So real big trend on, on you know, how you feel, and, uh, and Dave's kind of kind of led that uh, cool. movement. So as far as um, Dallas is concerned. And then John Prine would be one. John Prine, country singer, who just lost his throat. I just found that out, right? Or, didn't mean to bring you down, but... Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I knew he was a big record guy, so I brought him a John Prime <laughs> record, and he asked me how I knew John Prime, and yeah. so, you know, it's a great really it on that. Yeah. Nice. You guys still watching? Um, how about Dallas? A lot of guys in here, their entire life, myself included, um, it, it all depends on the economy in Dallas and our city, and a lot of people are kind of waiting for the John Prime record to stop, but, you know, us people that have more education and information and knowledge realize that what Dallas has that all the other people don't have other than entrepreneurs like Blake, because we have an influx of people moving here every single day. But what's your take on the economy in general, and then specifically our economy here in Dallas? Yeah, um, you know, I I think Dallas is a great place to you know to raise a family. Um, you know, just kind of on the on the business side, what I've noticed is Dallas is a real kind of a hard asset city. You know, what what's your oil and gas, what's your real estate kind of type stuff, and so. Uh, I think when we're able to get involved with these these kind of emerging brands, there's been a big appetite for it because it's it's outside of kind of uh, really the two asset classes that people uh, in this town are, are most familiar with. Um, but uh, you know, we used to have a kind of want to think we're going to get back to Austin, and uh, and then the the deeper our roots got in Dallas, the more you know we know that Dallas is home and uh, it's a great city for us. How so, would you describe yeah. Dallas to someone who? doesn't really understand it. I think, I think it's come a long way. Um, you know, maybe it's just getting older in this in this city, but uh, I think, you know, culturally, I think with the Arts District, with uh, uh, 
phenomenal restaurants that we have we have here. Um, the shopping is incredible. I mean, you have people from around the country that keep apartments here and keep uh, high rises here just so they can come here to shop. You know, so that's great. Uh, you got the parks with Clyde Warren Park and um, and what's going on there. And uh, so I think it's been great. Cool. What questions do you guys have? Blake, what's what's your typical, you know, as far as a quantity is concerned, how much do you look to invest in a certain venture, uh, or even from a percentage of the company, how much do you guys uh, look at potentially investing in your uh, target companies? Yeah, uh, typically uh, write checks from uh, five hundred thousand up to five million. Uh, depends on the, you know, depends on the company. Um, uh, mo- you know, the thing about these emerging companies is they don't they don't need a you know, if, if you're going to go do real estate and build a building, you need $100 million. You know, if you're going to do some big oil and gas thing, you need $100, $200 million. These companies need like five, you know. So what we find is more often than not, we have, uh, we have a bigger appetite than, than what we're allowed to, allowed to participate for. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's typically the – kind of typically the size. Um, I wouldn't say – because in, in oil and gas terms, you, you think of what percentage of, the, of that do you own. We don't – look at it quite as, you know, what percentage of this company or that do I own. So follow on, are you industry agnostic? Uh, well, we've looked at, uh, we've done some apparel companies. Uh, we've, <coughs> done, um, uh, we've done some oil and gas technology companies, uh, but typically try to, try to stick with the, um, you know, typically consumer product. Okay. Yeah. So looking at a, uh, at a um, children's, um, school book textbook company right now so a little bit outside of our realm but really that opportunity came just through uh, the network that we've built and um, people that we've been involved and co-invested on other deals with that uh, I thought were fortunate and blessed and they they include us and say hey here's here's what it is let me know if you guys want to want to be involved so oh this is one of the products you're currently invested in yep okay can you tell us when y'all did the investment and yeah. do y'all look to do an eventual sale for your return or do y'all get yeah. prep on your money at all? Yeah. Or do you have the option to stay with the company if they don't sell? Yeah. Uh, that particular one came through... Uh, what is it called? Uh, it's called Watermelon Water. Uh, that particular one came through uh, Clayton and, and Rohan and those uh, Cobbler guys. Yeah. Um, and it's... Uh, so it's actually Watermelon Water but didn't have any of the vowels so it's only the essentials. It's more electrolytes than uh, Gatorade, less sugar, and tastes better. As Ray, yeah, as our question. spokesman Ray will tell you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know that's that's the tough. That's other the other tough thing uh, when you talk to Dallas investors is people are used to buying real estate and getting a you know six percent coupon or something that kind of pays along the way. Typically, you know, on these brands they don't. Uh, you pay when you when you sell the when you sell the company, and uh, yeah, and so. Um, yeah, that's one that's been great. Uh, you know, Beyonce is an investor there. Uh, Kevin Durant with his 35 Ventures is a, an investor. Uh, Chris Paul, uh, an investor. So you talk about the power of, you know, and that's a women-run company. That's a trend that we like. Uh, we do, uh, I wouldn't say prefer, but we do uh, value and appreciate women-run companies. They, they tend to, the highs aren't so high and the lows aren't so low. It's if you have a, a male run company. Um, wow. yeah. Have you heard of um, Mother's Beverage out of Dallas? Yeah. I think yeah. that okay, yeah. I think that guy from Shark Tank just he invested. Yeah. 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 Apple cider vinegar. Yeah. Type drink. Yeah. Great product. Saw yeah, great some, product. Saw some today. What is it yeah, called? Really good. It's called Mother it's called Mother's Beverage, beverage out like of the, Dallas. Is that the big apples the big vinegar one that everyone drinks with like the yellow label? No, it's yeah. not. It's a new one. It's oh, really? the labels it's really kind of clean, simple, mostly the bottle with like a white label. <coughs> they have different flavors like blood orange and ginger lime. Blue Excellent orange. product, really yeah. good. Yeah. I keep asking. Do you know the they, people, the founders? I met one of them when I was in Sam's and first tried it, but I've bought it like in bulk, but they, they move different Sam's. So yeah. I've asked them like, when are you gonna get to, I'm actually a Costco girl, so. Yeah. Uh, I gotta like borrow the parents' car to get to Sam's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that yeah, that's uh, we did not participate in that one, but familiar with the brand and, okay. um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a great you know a great product. Probably too early, I would say probably a little too much on the early side. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like you'll have kind of 
ever success as a shadow type deal, I think you'll see a lot of those others. And so how fast can they, you know, can they grow? One thing we focus on, um, guys, Courtney and Carter uh, Rum, Rum out of uh, oh, California. Yeah. Was Beave. yeah, I started Beave. Okay. Uh, uh, we kind of co- co-invested in some deals that they're also in, but they, they wrote a great book called uh, uh, How to Jumpstart Your Startup or Quick Start Your Startup or something like that. But it's a, uh, they talk about are you a speedboat or a sailboat, and kind of knowing uh, knowing what you are. Uh, speedboats are great, uh, but they got to go. I'd, I'd consider favor a speedboat. You got to go really, really, really fast, and you got to have a lot of fuel. And if you don't get to your destination and you run out of fuel, meaning VC money mm-hmm. and funding, then you're kind of stuck dead in the water, and it's tough to get going again. Versus a uh, uh, you know a sailboat, a uh, little different speed. Um, you can kind of adjust your sails to whatever the wind is, is doing. Um, I, one of the brands that we're in is a, a Kel chip company that, uh, you know, it's, I consider that a, a sailboat where uh, kind of the trend of everyone's eating kale now, or, you know, but nobody really liked kale, but everybody claimed to be eating it. Uh, but they're just kind of out there. And then uh, uh, as they were, you know, as they were kind of growing that side of the company, what really took off was the dehydrated uh, fruits and vegetables for them. So now they have, uh, mango bites and uh, carrot sticks and tomato chips and all these other things. So what started off as as one thing adjusted their sales and now they're a great growing company. Was there a deal that you had the opportunity to participate in and passed and then it, it took off? Uh, no, not. I mean, not yet that I can think of. Uh, you know, I, one that I wish that I was in, obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty, is uh, is Halo Top. You know, those guys, it's a phenomenal story. I know some guys around town, around uh, Dallas. And I, a guy in Fort Worth is actually the only person that would give them money. They went to, kind of back to your question, you know, they went to everybody to, to raise money. And You guys uh, know what that is? Yeah. It's the number one ice cream brand. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a company, it's, they make, they're profitable. They make $50 million a year and they're worth, 1.5 to 2.5 billion and they don't have an office. They literally work from their couch. No way. Yeah, and they're literally wow. kicking Ben and Jerry's and Blue Bell's butt. Oh, they sell ice cream. Everywhere. Wow. What's that? It's all. It's, it's, wow. pro, it's pro, they realized they could make a, they could make an ice cream uh, that was, that tasted delicious and was high protein and you had people uh, in San Francisco buying it yeah. and literally eating a pint of it after dinner for their protein and it was, <laughs> it was delicious. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'd say that our, you know, RX Bar was one that we kind of heard about, but uh, was never presented the opportunity to, to do. And that obviously a great story there. Another guy, another founder that took a long time to find capital finally said, "I'll just do it myself." And then he sold for six hundred million bucks to uh, Kellogg. Kellogg. Or one of those guys. Kellogg. Yeah. Yeah. So. Some of that, the Airbnb deck we looked at today, we didn't get the opportunity there, but, uh, but yeah. Hey, buddy. Uh, what the, what's the Tom and Sherry's, that's one. <laughs> Tom and Sherry's. <laughs> I don't want to get away from us. What uh, is like the revenue level that you say is the threshold, like that's where, where a company needs to be for us to be on our radar? What's too small, what's just right, what, what's, what's it hit where it's like, oh, it's, it's too I, far? I would say a million dollars a year on the, on the low end so that's eighty thousand you know roughly eighty thousand dollars a month in uh in revenue we, that's not a hard that's not a you know categorically we're out if it's underneath that but um but that's really kind of uh where we like for companies to get because one if you're if you're doing a million a year in revenue it tells us that you you've got buy-in from multiple markets you know and you've been able to kind of expand outside of your uh you know outside of your uh immediate network and things like that. And uh, and then you really got to get acquired, you really gotta be five million, but probably more like 20 million a year or more in revenue to really get on the radar of these large uh, strategic companies that, that buy up the smaller companies. What type of role do you guys play after investment? Uh, depends, uh, we've taken board seats uh, before. We've never actually, we've never led around yet. Um, Got close on on one and decided not to. Um, what do you but, mean by that? I mean, it'd be the kind of the, the largest investor in the round that sets oh. the terms and and 
negotiates the term sheet and uh, and takes the board seats and all that. Uh, we 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 have a couple board seats on a couple different brands, um, but really uh, as as much or as little as the the founders want to. You know, we like to see who else is on the cap table with us, and if it's um, you know some massive company that's got 30 employees that can help redesign your your label and can get you into you know then you know um, we'll be there to, to help make introductions or uh, you know or things like that. And some founders, you know, some founders really really need the the expert. I, I wouldn't say that we're, we're the we're not the expert in, on, on the board. You know, we can look at financials and give advice and <clears throat> suggest when they should raise the next round of capital, how much that should look like, what structure that should look like. Uh, but there's better people than us out there that uh, are typically co-investing in these brands with us that can uh, kind of help steer the ship a little more. So you like to see strategic investors alongside you as well? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and we find ourselves on some pretty interesting uh, kind of pretty interesting bedfellows uh, for some of the deals that we've been able to get in. Have you had any deals that you got into that didn't go the way you planned? And some that failed? Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the first investment we ever made that I mentioned was the, the bar restaurant. That, that was a disaster, but that <coughs> kind of a whole different story and category there. Um, but no, I mean, even, uh, you know, um, we can look at some and, and kind of see that. Uh, they might be having issues, but they're usually they're usually fixable. There hasn't been there haven't been any that um, you know have said it hasn't been a big loss. Yeah, yeah. not yet. That's good. So there's been some that have taken a little longer to exit than we thought. Mm -hmm. um, you know that we maybe projected a we'll be in this company for five years before it sells, and now we're on year seven. But you know the company's profitable and making money. So okay. good good news is they don't need you know more money. And when something like that, when you're trying to exit, do you have already have a pool of people that you're going to talk to, or is it something where you put it out there for the like the, the specific public? Uh, it's usually investment bankers that, that take over at that point, and they'll go figure out the company. They'll do the kind of the forensic audit, and they'll find the three or four uh, strategics that would be most interested in it versus putting it up into like a bid nice. a bid scenario. Cool. Okay. Do you guys have any more questions? I got one more. Uh, so definitely off what we've been talking about, uh, are y'all raising capital for your company? And uh, what do you look for in investors in your business? Yep. Uh, not, we're currently not raising capital, but uh, that um, it's kind of, uh, you know, that could change tomorrow. Sometimes things, you know, move in an interesting rhythm and um, you never know when that, when that next opportunity is there. But currently we're not. Um, and what you know, what we look for is, um, you know, we're typically uh, it's basically our network. It's uh, it's uh, friends and family. It's people that we we uh, feel like we've been blessed with an opportunity and, and have pretty decent deal flow. And, and uh, we'll we'll send it out and say, here's the situation. Let us know if you want to participate. So it's a deal by deal basis. Yes. Yeah, and that's kind of back to the. What Rogers and I were talking about earlier is, uh, you know, when I first moved to Dallas, it's right when, when Facebook uh, came about, and I still remember my buddy David called me, and, Wiley, get to your computer, type in the Facebook, <laughs> type it in, now go to UT, oh my God. all right, now click on communication majors. <laughs> Look at all those blondes, man. <laughs> and in the first days of it, it was like organized by university yeah. and by major, and. Uh, I thought, okay, and, um, you know, neat, and, uh, <laughs> and, but then I was over in the end streets, as you know, and, and we started having, and uh, Wolf was my roommate, and we started having, um, you know, parties at the house, and uh, St. Patty's Day, and all this, and so, Texas OU, Texas OU every year, and so, um, really what happened was you were able, at that point, to start connecting with people without, you know, our parents couldn't, you know, when our parents were our age, they knew the people on their street, the people at work, and that's about it. They didn't know, you know, some random person that was at a party with them five years ago, but now I know, you know, what that person, what they did this morning, right? And so, that, I think that's, and, and now all those people that used to go to all those, most of them are, you know, upperly mobile, running their own companies, uh, doing exciting things. And so it's, it's uh, just uh, kind of the time that we're in and being able to build a network that way has been, uh, has been great to the, 
kind of uh, the business and how we put it together. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Anybody else? Any, any questions online? Cool. Oh, okay. yeah. So there's another one. I figured we have a few jokers online that wanted to. Yeah, there was one. Here. Take it's shots. Uh, yeah, it was your name? You came in late. What was your name? Austin. Austin. I was going to see. Uh, have you ever thought about doing your own CPG product, or do you have any? You got any ideas? What does that acronym mean? <sighs> That's the pot stuff again. <laughs> yeah. no, That's CBD. He C said CP. That was C the whole rose yeah. thorn. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, CPG is consumer package good. Oh. So it's you know, stuff you, you buy. Uh, I, I'm just not the creative type. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've thought about it. When you read Courtney Carter's book, I mean, it really makes you think about. Because uh, in that same kind of boat example, they also talk about. There's also huge ships and Google and Amazon being those huge ships. And when they come by, it throws off all these wakes. And there's a lot of companies that come about in, in, in those wakes, you know. And, uh, and so you kind of start thinking about that and what's, what's the next big trend. But uh, personally, I just don't feel like I'm the, I'm the cre creative enough guy to, to, to build a brand out, you know. We have friends that are, and, and they build it, and it's, it's amazing, you know. Uh, the founder of Outdoor Voice, you know, we knew her before she started the brand, and um, you know, we uh, thought, man, if this goes, you know, if this goes perfect and everything lines up for you, you know, this could be a twenty million dollar company, and you know, today she'll do one hundred and twenty million this year in revenue. So, uh, I've, yeah, I've, I've thought about it, but I'm just not the creative, the creative the enough uh, type. What's that? CBD is that oil stuff? Yeah, CBD is the oil stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like the oil stuff that you put in your mouth. Well, that's everything. They, you can put it, yeah. I mean, I had, a, I had one guy who from Lisa's space and he's like, I want to open CBD. It's called American Shaman or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because they're growing everywhere. They, uh, yeah, it's perfectly legal. <laughs> you still walk in, you know. I think what you'll see there, I mean, you still, you, you still walk into the, sto the store in his building. Yeah. You still walk in and you're kind of going like this, but yeah. <laughs> it's perfectly legal. So, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think you'll see. Um, you know, as we get older and our kids, that I think you'll see kind of the Starbucks of CP CBD where it's it's branded <coughs> and it's uh, trusted, and you can go in there and, and that's where you, uh, you know, that's where you study and that's where you do these things and you have your your uh, CBD infused tea or uh, matcha yeah. or coffee or whatever it is. That's so. interesting. What was the question there? No, it was are the horns really back? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should, uh, we'll see. I won't go there yet, but we'll see. Cool, man. Bam, Bama's definitely not back. Bama. <laughs> Zing, oh, Zing, number six. Can, can I ask a serious question? <laughs> yeah. is, is your job fun? Do you think? Love it. it. Love, love it. it. Yeah. Love it. Do you feel like if you love what you do, you actually never work a day in your life? That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I will. Say, what I what I would say about uh, and I meant to say it earlier when you is people getting into getting into business is. Uh, and advice I was given when I was, when I was just coming out of college was to you know work for a company where you can affect the bottom line every day, and um, you know you can go work for a huge corporation and kind of work your way up the ladder that way, and that's one way to, to do it. But if you're at a smaller company, and I, and I think there's no, I mean in your industry there's no better way than that person's affecting the, their bottom line every single day, you know when they're trying to get a transaction done, and uh, so that's just this one piece of advice, and then. A piece of advice my buddy uh, Jim gave me is uh, we're really struggling on a deal and uh, kept trying to get it done, kept trying to get it done, and was stressed out about it. I was stressing, uh, stressing everybody in my home about it. You know, it was, it was, I was carrying around a, a lot of baggage there. And, um, you know, he said, you know, you, need, you really need to focus on what's moving towards you and what's moving away from you. And kind of, you know, <coughs> let, let go of the things that are moving away from you and kind of lean in and, and kind of gravitate towards the things that are moving towards you. And so that's just another piece of advice I thought was, has really helped me when I come across difficulties or exciting things, you know, yeah. just to, to really keep that in mind. Cool, man. Well, you've done an awesome job. You obviously have a lot of fans out there and people that respect you and, and, and are, you know, very encouraged by what you've done. You've done it as a man of faith and you've done it as a, you know, person that puts the right things first. So congrats on all you've done and all you're doing, and uh, if there's anything you want to close us out with, maybe like the Texas fight song or some push-ups. <laughs> yeah, th hey, thanks for joining. Uh, first time on uh, Facebook uh, Facebook Live, so uh, that was exciting. But um, no, hey, thanks for having me. Beautiful home.
Um, great setup here. So happy to do it. Cool. Cheers. Thanks, Blake. Yep.